Hi, welcome to BAL, Building Athletic Lifestyles. I'm Neil. Today we're going to be talking about pelvic tilts. So just before we start, we're going to make sure we're all on the same page as well. So we're going to just quickly run through a bit of basic anatomy first, make sure we're all on the same page. Then from there, why these are relevant, what's the impacts of it, and also how we can then influence them going forwards. So first protocol is understanding what even is the pelvis, the pelvic girdle. It's that midline through typically called the hips. So if you've got those big two bones either side of the hips that tend to tilt forwards or back, they can also move independently ever so slightly with when you're walking, things like that. That is your pelvic girdle through there. I'll put an image up for you here as well so you can have a little look as I talk. So why is this even relevant is sometimes this can be a cause of pain and discomfort for some people if we get what we call adaptive shortening where we're in a set position for an extended period of time which then leads to this adaptive shortening of certain muscles in certain regions which results in an undue amount of stress on certain areas hence the pain, discomfort, things like that. Classic example is in Western culture a lot of people sit at desk jobs to work spending that extended period of time sitting Hip flexors tend to tighten up a little, glutes tend to get a little inactive in terms of being under a period of stretch for an extended period of time. Result is that the lower back can take a little bit of extra strain and then that's where you get discomfort. One thing that will be a running theme as we go through these sort of topic by topic basis is that always treat the body as sort of like a, a kinetic chain. Just because you're feeling pain somewhere doesn't necessarily mean that's the cause of the pain itself. So diving into a little bit of anatomy, on the front side, the anterior, we have the hip flexors and the abdominals. The hip flexors are situated generally below the pelvis at the front, and the abdominals are situated generally above the pelvis at the front. Well, typically that's how we're going to think about them in terms of where they originate from and the actions they have on the pelvis. So the abdominals would pull the pelvis up at the front, and the hip flexors would pull the pelvis down at the front. Yeah? Also note that they are plurals as well, hip flexors, there's multiple, it's not a single muscle, it is a group of muscles, you have five of them in total. As well with the abdominals, it's a group of muscles, it's not a single muscle acting on its own. Conversely, on the other side, we've got the erector spinae, which is the lower back muscles, and then you've got the glutes themselves that sit below the pelvis. Same thing, so you've got the lower back will bring the pelvis up at the back, and then you've got the glutes that will bring the pelvis down at the back. The result is this seesaw in motion of the pelvis, we want to try and keep it nice and balanced. Getting into that, if we just dive down here to this next picture, the general rule of thumb in terms of that tilt is we should have that ever so slight anterior tilt, so a slight tilt forwards. Not very much. For males, it's four to seven degrees of tilt. For females, it's seven to ten degrees of tilt. As a rough ballpark, remember that tilt, that neutral position is a range, it is not a fixed number that is perfect. There's a number of different individual characteristics that will determine what is the optimum position for you to be in. So jumping back to that diagram from before, if you've got the front of the hips here and the back of the hips here, we should have an ever so slight tilt, four to seven degrees for males, seven to 10 for females. If it's more of a tilt than that, we're into what we call an anterior pelvic tilt, a forward tilt. If you imagine a bucket of water, it would be pouring water out the front of the bucket. Opposite to that, you've got the posterior itself, which would be the, the opposing motion, where instead of being that four to seven degrees of slight tilt, instead we'd be tucked back under, could be closer to zero degree of tilt, or you can actually be slightly into a full posterior tilt. That would be pouring water out the back of the bucket. Yeah. So now you've got a little bit of an understanding of how they actually, how that looks and what that looks like. Just going to dive a little bit more into what generally causes this. This isn't always going to be the case, but in the large majority of situations this is applicable. So generally, what causes that anterior tilt, that tilt forwards, is a tightness of the hip flexors at the front of the hips, as well as a slight weakness relatively between the abdominals and the glutes on the back, which would then tilt the hips forward, yeah? So I've got this little diagram down here just to illustrate that. In red is the tightness, in blue is the weakness or the lengthened muscles. I say, I use the term weak, but it is all relative. If you've got extremely dominant hip flexors, you could still have very strong glutes, but relative to the hip flexors, they are weak. Yeah. So that offset motion creates that seesawing to tilt forwards. It's the opposite then with the posterior pelvic tilt, where you've got tightness instead, from the abdominals and glutes, also possibly down into more into that posterior chain, which is the hamstrings and calves as well, which we will get into. But also it is a weakness of the hip flexors that aren't pulling the pelvis down. Instead, it's getting tilted up, yeah? So the first protocol, now that we've got a bit more of an understanding of how it all ties together, is then to dive a little bit into identifying yourself, what, where is your pelvic alignment at? So there's a couple of easy ways to do this. The simplest one that you can do at home is just to find yourself a mirror and stand side on. 
Here, what we're looking at is if you've got the, the ASIS and the PSIS, so on the hip bones themselves, you've got the anterior and posterior side of them, little bony processes. What we're looking for is the correlation between those two. Yeah, if you've noticeably got a big difference between the two of them, that'll illustrate that tilt forwards of the hips. Also, you can have a little look at the lower back. If you have got a, a lot of what we call a lordotic curve, where that lower back scoops back, that is usually an indicator that you may well may also have an anterior pelvic tilt too. But generally look at those, those bones of the hips themselves, if it's tilted forwards, if it's tilted back. If you're struggling to really tell, what you can do is get something like a belt, tie the belt round so that you've got the belt fastened at the front on that ASIS and then at the back it's on the PSIS. Just to give you that illustration, you've got then a physical line that you can see where that angle is in terms of the, the hips themselves, what degree of tilt you've got. Another option you can do is something called an excursion test. So this is when you stand naturally, wherever is comfortable for you, the neutral position that you, you default to. From there, you want to actively try and tilt the hips into as much anterior pelvic tilt as possible, then go back to neutral, and then from neutral, tilt into that posterior tilt as much as possible as well. If you find that in one of the movements you can't go much further, generally that's a good indicator that you're already in that range of motion. So say you had a slight anterior pelvic tilt already, and then you tried to tilt further, but you couldn't actually go very far before you hit that mechanical limit. That's a good indicator of you being in an anterior pelvic tilt because you'll also then be able to go much further into that posterior pelvic tilt, that tuck under, as vice versa as well. So you may have found that quite awkward trying to tilt the pelvis and it might have felt a little clumsy, a little unnatural. So what you can do to get more familiar with that is actually to take a little bit of time just to go through some, some pelvic tilts itself on its own. So an easy way of doing this is to lie yourself down on your back and go through tilting the, the hips as far tucked in under as you can into as much posterior tilt as possible and then tilt them back the other way into anterior pelvic tilt. Just practicing this you know, a couple of times a day in the morning just to get familiar with it is really good for helping you control the pelvis and the hips going forwards. Good, so now that we've got an idea of where your, your pelvic alignment's at, if you're bang in the neutral zone, brilliant. That just means you need to keep your training balanced as you're going forwards to make sure that we're not offsetting anything. If you do have a degree of anterior or posterior tilt, we're just going to briefly cover what you can do to action that as well. Now, one thing that's very important is we want to address the cause, not necessarily the symptoms. So quite often, if you have an anterior pelvic tilt, which is what we'll cover first, remember that's the water going out the front of the bucket, it will quite often be coupled with a little bit of discomfort through the back itself. That's because in that tilted position, as you tilt forwards, the lower back muscles here, those are the ones that shorten up, they get quite tight and they take a little bit more strain than they really should be doing in your, your day to day. You see this a lot more in individuals that are sitting, like I mentioned before, desk jobs, things like that. You're more likely to develop a degree of uh, anterior pelvic tilt. So what do we need to do about it? If we come back to that cross shape that we were talking about before, it's usually come down to a weakness or a relative weakness between the glutes and the abdominals compared to the hip flexors. So to even that out, we're going to spend a little bit of time first strengthening the glutes. So something as an example would be a hip thrust, so a glute bridge, whatever you want to call it, where we're getting a posterior pelvic tilt also going into hip extension. Something like that where we can challenge those glutes to become more active, to work a little bit harder, get a little bit stronger, will certainly help you on your way. Alongside that, we want to then also strengthen the abdominals, but it's important that we don't also strengthen the hip flexors because they're already tight. They're already contributing to this anterior pelvic tilt. So you actually want to be very careful about the movements you choose. Something like a uh, lying leg raised, which also has the hip flexors engaged, may actually compound the problem and make it worse. So a suitable alternative is something called an RKC plank, where in that position we actively have contraction of the glutes, we also actively have contraction of the lower abdominals, the transverse abdominals, that we can get into that posterior pelvic tilt under load to then challenge you to get stronger in that position. So the hip flexors, we break them down, there's five of them. So we break them down into how they affect the hip and the position of the leg that it's in when it's affected from the hip. So lifting the leg straight up is usually done by the TFL, tensor fascia lata, the rectus femoris, and the, which is one of the quad muscles, and the sartorius, which is one of the ones that run up the inside of the leg a little bit more. So if your leg is straight and you're lifting it up to say 90 degrees, the, those three will be working in conjunction to complete that movement. If we have the knee bent and we're going from 90 degrees higher, so driving up from 90 degrees with the knee bent, then it becomes to the other two of the hip flexors, and those are your psoas and also your iliacus. So iliacus being on the iliac crest in the, in the hips itself. So we want to be aware of that because it affects how we then lengthen them. It tends to be if you feel the pain in the front of the hips, 
that you'll actually feel that a little bit more from the iliacus and the psoas. So we want to take that into consideration as we're picking the stretches we're going to do. Some variation of a half kneeling lunge is generally a good practice. I will do a full video in terms of how you actually understand which ones are tight and if you even have tight hip flexors as well, but we'll get to that at a later date. So from there, hopefully that puts you in a position where you can start addressing that anterior pelvic tilt. If that's not you, if you have the posterior pelvic tilt, it's sort of flipped the other way. So instead, we've got this weakness of the hip flexors that we want to strengthen. So we do that through some degree of leg lift. So whether it's a straight leg lift or it's a bent leg lift, you essentially do the opposite motions to what we were trying to stretch before for the anterior pelvic tilt. In terms of the lengthening, we want to focus a little bit more on the entire posterior chain. So the posterior chain is the muscles that run down the back of the body. So if you imagine again, we go back to that pelvis position where this is the front, this is the back. If we've got this posterior pelvic tilt, now everything that runs down the back of the leg is going to be getting shortened and going to get that adaptive shortening that leads to that tight feeling as well. So that includes things like the hamstrings that can affect um, hip extension as well. So if the hamstrings are tight, they also they cross the knee, it tends to lead to a bit of tightness through the, the calves as well. So we want to lengthen everything up together. So I've just drawn a little stick man down here to illustrate a good little stretch that can help with opening that up. But we want to make sure that we're lengthening the hamstrings, but we're also keeping ourselves in a position where the spine above the hip stays neutral as we're doing those stretches. Good, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of what you can do to start addressing that pelvic tilt that you've got. If you don't have one, make sure you're keeping your training nice and balanced. If you do or if you don't have a tilt, one thing that's really important is that we keep consistent. We want to have targeted work to make sure we're addressing any areas that need special attention. But also if you don't need special attention, if you're already in a neutral position, we want to make sure we're keeping the balance between this whole seesawing of the hips itself. We don't want to generate some degree of uh, excessive pelvic tilt but through our training and then have to address this at a later date. It's also important to make sure that you regularly retest your pelvic tilt because it may be that through lifestyle changes or even through some of your training that you may actually be compounding an area um, where you have an excessive tilt or you may actually be generating a, a reason to have a tilt. Regular retesting will allow you to make sure that you are keeping your pelvis nice and neutral all the way throughout. I hope this has helped. If you've got any other topics or suggestions, even any questions, drop it down in the comments below and I'll get back to you from there. Leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it, if you found it helpful, and I'll see you in the next one.